University's um, continuing discussion about the US presidential election 2016 issues and perspective. I'm Tracy Arclay from the School of Government and International Relations and I'm joined today by Associate Professor Luis Cabrera who's here to talk about um, immigration, a very vexed issue um, in this presidential campaign, campaign. But also, Lewis, we've seen this across Australia, in the UK, with the Brexit vote. But when I read about what's going on in the US election, it seems to me that there's a couple of main issues that constantly kind of emerge. One is the erosion of the middle class, and the other is immigration. So, with immigration in mind, Donald Trump has got quite a lot of attention for his proposal to build a wall along the full US-Mexico border um, to deter unauthorised immigration. What do you think that proposal, um, why has it been such a big hit amongst Trump supporters and would it make economic sense? It's a, that's a good question. It's, a, it's such a dramatic symbol. It's a wall after all. You know, what, do you, what do you put up in human history when you want to keep people out? With walls. Yeah. We've, we've always done that. Um, and Trump has offered to build a wall across the entire border. So we're talking about 3,000 kilometers, more than 2,000 miles. There's about 700 miles of fencing there already, but he's talking about a 35 to 40 foot co precast concrete wall um, with uh, people to staff it all the way across. So, you know, the Great Wall of America, <laughs> if you like. Yes. And I, I think one of the reasons well, that's... We're going to walk. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think one of the reasons that's been such a hit with his base in particular, because it's generated a lot of opposition elsewhere, including from moderate Republicans and uh, most in the Democratic Party. I think for his base, um, and studies have shown so that there's been this very systematic study over more than a year, um, uh, surveying 87,000 people about their support for various candidates and various issues. And the ones who tended to support Trump were people, predominantly white people, who live in communities that are not racially diverse and who also have the lower levels of education. So they're the ones, uh, interestingly, who line up almost perfectly with the groups which most strenuously oppose immigration in similar surveys, in surveys about immigration. So this is the demographic that is naturally sort of predisposed to be concerned about immigrants. And then Trump, um, as is his style, you know, comes out with a very bold, dramatic proposal, and it, it lends itself to slogans, you know, build the wall, build the wall. So I think as a, um, as a piece of, of political um, maneuvering, it was, uh, it was really masterful, actually, in terms of appealing to his base. But it doesn't have that same appeal to others. So it's just sort of a populist appeal. I, I would think so. I, would, I, okay. I think that's right. In the third debate, um, Donald Trump accused Hillary Clinton of favoring open borders. I think this is great new thing. Um, she says she's for comprehensive immigration reform. It was, what is her actual proposals and how would they compare to those pursued more recently in the United States? Well, hers are going to look very familiar. Um, she's talking about a path to citizenship for the between 10 and 11 million people currently living in the country without authorization documentation. Often the government knows where they are. They're working through the process. Often the government doesn't know where they are. Um, but uh, we've got a pretty good idea of the numbers. And this has been a proposal that's been in various bills in Congress all through the 2000s and before. It's had some bipartisan support. It, uh, it made some progress in its last iteration, but didn't quite make it all the way through both houses of Congress. So there will be familiar elements to this. Um, so a path to citizenship for people who can show that they've been of good character, they haven't committed a lot of crimes, that sort of thing. And then also um, she's talking about continuing President Obama's stay of deportation for kids who were born in the, or kids of, of, uh, who were brought to the United States um, before they were 16 years old. Is that the dreamers? Um, they, would be they would be covered under that. They're, it's related to, to them. This would be a state of deportation from, from, you know, for a few years uh, until, presumably until uh, comprehensive immigration reform can be sorted out. And then also for their families, but that's been tied up now in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court deadlocked on that. Uh, Clinton has committed to, to continuing that. It's not sure, it's not clear what she'll be able to do. But she would also continue, I think this is an important part, uh, point, the, um, 
emphasis on enforcement that's been in place for some time at the border. So I, I used to work in uh, Arizona, and um, I spent a lot of time doing field research in the border, and people talk about it as a militarized border. Well, it is very much so. Uh, when I was there in the mid-2000s, the, the National Guard had been called to the border, and there were actual National Guard uh, troops you know, who would be attached to the Army. Um, and because it was seen as such a problem. Yes, yes, over. yes. Uh, and there were also, of course, the Border Patrol agents, you know, um, carry a good bit of weaponry these days. Um, it's not military assault weaponry, but it's certainly rifles, it's shotguns, it's, it's uh, weapons they can use if they feel threatened. And there are, um, in, in some senses, we already have a wall at the border. So you asked about the economic sense. Yeah. Um, there are about 700 miles of fencing, as I mentioned, but there are also 12,000 sensors in the ground that trip when people cross. There are people sitting in these very, very high-tech rooms for the Border Patrol uh, watching with this sort of heat detection technology. So when somebody's crossing, you can see them in sort of black and white imagery, you know, they're little white figures running across the brush, and, and they can pretty much pinpoint where people are crossing. They've got drones in the sky, they've got dirigibles in the sky. Uh, really, billions and billions have been poured into this enforcement effort. So we've got a virtual wall there, and um, it appears that Clinton will continue that enforcement emphasis, which is actually a little more controversial than we've seen. Um, a lot of the human rights groups on the border, a lot of the immigrant rights groups, have been pointing out for years that this emphasis, which arose in the early 1990s, or the mid-1990s, about the same time NAFTA was being passed, and the two are often seen as related, uh, has resulted in the deaths of more than 4,000 crossers. Because what's happened is um, the strategy is to funnel the crossers out into the desert to really harden the crossings, the, the, the standard urban crossings at Nogales, at San Diego, and make it almost impossible for people to get through there um, because there are actual walls there. So, so are we talking children as well? Were there children that are making these crossings? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, parents, I mean, I've, I've seen children this tall, you know, out in the desert holding their parents' hands. We've got some pictures of that from the field research. And a lot of, you know, um, and so. Uh, the thousands, 4,000 people have died since about the early 1990s. It's down now because um, apprehensions are actually down. The number of people crossing is actually way down. Apprehensions is typically the figure that the Border Patrol uses to indicate how many people are crossing because they figure they're catching a certain percentage. Yeah. And it's down now to its lowest level in 40 years. So that ties back into the question of whether the wall makes economic it makes sense. sense. You know. But the rhetoric clearly he thought worked. Yes. With his yes. base. Um, okay, so we talked a bit about Clinton's attitude to to border crossings. Um, how else would Clinton's proposals, how do they compare with Trump's in other ways? Mm. Well, they're almost polar opposite, right. almost. Um, as I say, Clinton's plan would still have that strong enforcement emphasis on the border. Um, Trump would uh, sort of double down on everything she wants to do. And one of the interesting things that he proposed that, again, resonated strongly with his base was initially a ban on all Muslim immigration, a temporary ban for security reasons. So he's, he's very much tied Muslim immigration to terror threats. And, uh, and that's resonated strongly, again, with his base. And that's been scaled back a bit or modified to a, uh, in, in the current iteration of the plan that you can find on his website, to a ban from countries that have been affected by terrorism. And the countries that are named are all predominantly Muslim countries, so Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, he did recently mention also, somebody asked him, well, what about France, which has been affected by terrorism? And he seemed to say, well, yes, we, we would consider a ban on immigration from France as well. Do you think that, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but there was an ad just released recently by Hillary Clinton's team with um, featuring, you know, the Khan family, whose mm -hmm. son was killed. And it's a very, you know, very potent ad, basically saying, you know, about they were Muslim, that they were, he, the son that was killed saving all those American lives was a Muslim American, and would you really, do you really think that he wouldn't be a suitable candidate for moving here? Mm -hmm. So it really is playing, I think, also into her hands a little bit, do you think, mm -hmm. that she's... Oh, I think uh, certainly Hillary Clinton's team, there was, there was a reason they picked Mr. Khan to give that talk yes. at the convention. Yes. Um, and the, uh, it's, it's part of the pushback. So Donald Trump, I think Donald Trump has set much of the agenda on immigration and on what the Clinton team has done. So you, you haven't actually heard, as, as many have pointed out, in the three debates, um, it's not been so much about policy, substantive policies, it has been about personality. 
and about claims that have been made. So when Donald Trump says um, we need, to, because of the, the severe threat, we need to ban temporarily all Muslim immigration, then the Clinton camp comes up with a response. And I think we've seen that over and over again. And I think, uh, so you know, Hillary Clinton would prefer, I think, not to be talking about a wall along the full length of the border, which could cost $24 billion. And the idea that Mexico will pay for it is probably not realistic, although there, there is a plan in place. Yeah, OK, very uh, interesting. One other thing about um, Donald Trump's immigration plan that's interesting is he would have, he would create effectively a new force, a deportation force. And um, this is not new in the United States, actually. These things tend to go in cycles. So up until about 1924, the US didn't even have um, border controls effectively, like a lot of countries do. Yeah. Um, and then about that time, uh, there's st the border force started to be developed. A little later than that, um, the, there was a push to mass, uh, to mass deport Mexicans back to Mexico. And what happened, a lot of people now will say, when we hear this deport deportation force, we think of that time. Okay. And we think of the people who were just sort of rounded up and put on trains and sent back, even though they might, they might never have been in Mexico. They might have been born in the United States oh, okay. and just been ethnically Mexican. So this um, has raised, I mean, Hillary Clinton has strongly opposed this. And this, is, this has been one of the real points of contention, where she is looking for a way to regularize the status of people who've been in the United States um, largely more than 10 years. So what we what we know from the, the studies is that the unauthorized migrant population is pretty well settled. Most, um, the, the large percentage, you know, 70 plus, have been in the United States for 10 years plus. So they're embedded in our communities. They pay taxes. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, they pay about $14 billion a year to um, the Social Security Administration, the National Pension in the United States. And, and about a billion dollars is able to be claimed back legally by people who've been in, but the other is just surplus to the U.S. Okay. government. Um, Paying more taxes than Donald Trump himself. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the deportation force—it's—it's it's another symbol, uh, I think, for Trump. But it's also an example, a strong example of where he would place the emphasis. And it's actually a uh, again a doubling down of what the Obama administration is doing, because Obama, at least until recently, has really put a lot of emphasis on rounding people up where they can be found on making it much, much harder for employers to hire unauthorized immigrants and sending people back. So um, compared to the Bush administration, the Obama administration has sent quite a few more people back. It's not clear whether Hillary Clinton is going to give it that same emphasis. And I, I, from what I can read and from what I've heard, I'm not sure she will. I think she will probably move back home. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, you said before, and the numbers are sort of going down, that there's a roundabout an estimated 10 million unauthorized immigrants living in the United States at the moment. And, you know, we've spoken about how Donald Trump has kind of used that number as saying that they're a threat to America. Um, what does the research, as an academic, what, does the res what do the researchers um, think of the actual impacts in terms of crime rates, in terms of economics, and any other areas that mm -hmm. you think might be important to well, again, In terms of really symbolic, effective, well, effective symbolic politics. Um, Trump has come up with um, sort of uh, an anecdotal way of bringing home his point about the threat from criminal aliens. That's one of the things he's really wanted to emphasize. And what he's done at his rallies and some of his, uh, his major immigration speech was bring what he calls angel moms. Um, and these are mothers who've had children killed by unauthorized migrants. Um, and so, it, it, uh, again, it really resonates with his base. It makes a very dramatic statement about uh, the kinds of emphasis he wants to place uh, on immigration enforcement and on, uh, on deportations. Uh, what the numbers have been telling us pretty consistently for a while now is that unauthorized migrants tend to commit crimes overall, including violent crimes at lower rates than citizens and legal residents. And it, and it makes a sort of, you know, you can, you can apply common sense to it that if, you're, um, if you get caught and will be deported, you kind of watch yourself. Absolutely. And that was my experience in, in the field research done over five or six years around Arizona and New Mexico. Most of the unauthorized migrants um, with whom I spoke were very, very concerned about putting any toe out of the line, you know, about you know, the most routine traffic stuff could easily turn into a deportation after you've been in the country for 10 years. So it's, um, that was a familiar trope. Um, but certainly, um, Mr. Trump has, has got the, the numbers, the facts and figures on unauthorized migrants who've committed serious crimes within the United States. 
And it's a relatively easy thing to highlight, to call attention to. And they do tend to get disproportionate attention when it's an unauthorized person who's killed someone. Um, economically, that's really interesting. And, and again, a lot of really smart economists have been studying this for a long time. And one of the things they found is that overall migration, including unauthorized migration, is a net benefit for economies. The people who tend not to do so well at it, or not as well, are the workers making the lowest wages, the workers with the, the lowest levels of education and technical skills. Um, but even there, the, uh, the hit is not huge. Um, some studies have found that it's uh, below one half of one percent in wage reduction. The, the most dramatic studies, or I guess the studies with the most dramatic findings, have been up to seven percent, but that's about as far as they can go, so a seven percent hit. And then when you get out of that uh, low wage category, the other, um, the other categories tend to, to just realize a net benefit. Um, so we've got kind of an interesting natural experiment there. So the state where I used to live, Arizona, um, right about the time I was getting ready to leave there, was passing some very harsh um, anti-unauthorized migration measures. And these resulted, so you'd have uh, one of the most uh, dramatic, which actually the Obama administration has gone after and tried to stop, has been um, instructing law enforcement officers during a routine stop to make sure they always ask the people for their um, citizenship status. So uh, actually, you know, effectively deputizing them as border control officers in Phoenix, which is quite far from the border, et cetera. And um, because of this additional pressure, because of some other uh, crackdown measures, uh, we actually saw 40% of the estimated population of unauthorized migrants leave within about five years. So they went to other states, some went back to Mexico. Um, and so we, we've got this nice natural experiment where we can see what would actually happen if you got rid of so many unauthorized people, or people who didn't have authorization to be there. And um, the Wall Street Journal recently hired a firm to actually you know, statistically investigate. Right. So they controlled for the effects of the Great Recession, of the financial crisis. And what they found was that Arizona had taken a hit of about 2% per year in gross domestic product Overall, of this yes, country, yes, fascinating. Um, the people who had benefited were the, again those low wage workers. So some of them had actually seen their wages rise a fairly significant amount. Um, employers were reported to have trouble finding enough workers. So across agriculture, but many other fields as well, building, um, because the people they used to be able to hire just weren't there anymore. Um, and then because of that dearth of workers, it led to an economic well, an economic drag, um, and a drag on job creation because you didn't have all those people um, making wages, spending it on rent, on groceries, mm -hmm. on clothes, all those other things that create jobs going outward. So I think that gives us some indication, at least, of what might happen if, if uh, Mr. Trump really were able to deport every single person in the way he's pledged. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been really interesting. And those debates actually carry on to in Australia. And if anyone is interested to read how immigration and migration has helped Australia, I recommend George Mendelgenis' book, Second Chance, who talks a lot about how it's benefited Australia as well. So these are universal themes. Thanks very much for listening today. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.